just pray um, before we get into God's word. Heavenly Father, we thank you that your word is living and active and sharper than two edged sword. Lord, that is beneficial in all its parts and everything for, for teaching and instructing, for encouraging, for rebuking, and for equipping of the saints. So, Lord, we pray as we gather around your word. Lord, we pray that it would almost be like the words leap off the page and into our hearts. Lord, we pray that, 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 that your word would excite us this morning. Lord, that it would enthuse us this morning. Lord, that we leave here transformed, not by anything that I would say or anything that the musicians would have done, but Lord, but because your word has spoken to us. Lord, we, we know that this is of you, that it is infallible, that it is perfect, that it is pure, that it is authoritative. So, Lord, as we read, as we study, as we apply it, Lord, may it impact us profoundly. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Okay, good morning again, folks. We are back into routine this week. I'm back into our study in Acts, turning to Acts 11. If you remember, we spent the last couple of chapters with Peter and uh, starting to see our real work being done outside the the kind of very Jewish-centric early primitive church. He had been there to witness Philip lead a work among the Samaritans in Acts 8. Uh, in Acts 9, he was in Joppa seeing uh, Dorcas raised back to life. Then in Acts 10, just before Christmas, we read of the vision that he had of the animals coming down on the sheep from heaven. God told him not to call unclean anything that had been called clean, to not contradict him in that. Peter in his Jewishness, assumed that this was about food laws, this was about um, you know, what he can eat and what he shouldn't eat, and maybe there was things happening there. But actually what was really being taught to him was that the gospel is for all people, those who are considered clean and those who are considered unclean, those who are undesirable, all can come. They don't need to come under the Jewish cultural umbrella to be saved. The invitation of the gospel is whoever you are, whatever's going on, you can come to Christ and be saved. You don't need to go to Moses and then to Jesus. Now, Peter, no time to think about any of this because no sooner did he know it than he's on his way to Cornelius' house, a Roman centurion. And in the last part in our series, we saw him preach the gospel. Friends of Cornelius and himself all got saved and Peter tells his friends who were with him to baptize these new believers. And really, when you go back to chapter 10, verse 44, the Holy Spirit fell on them in the same way that it fallen on the Samaritans in chapter 8 and on the Jews in chapter 2. God was making no distinction. This was the Great Commission that we read about all the way back in Acts 1, to go into all the world, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. God's making no distinction. People who are saved are saved. They are therefore equal in his eyes as redeemed, adopted children of God. These guys are on a level footing to the most Jewish of Jewish converts. Saved is saved. One Lord, one faith, one church, one baptism, Paul would go on to say in Ephesians 4. God is not making a distinction between the people that he has saved. All have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. All are saved by grace and not by works. All are adopted as sons and daughters through what Christ has done. There's no distinction for all in Christ. Now, as far as Peter is concerned <coughs> at this point, the matter is settled. The gospel is open to non-Jews. The Great Commission, as defined in Acts 1, is being fulfilled. But what we're going to see today is that Peter is not representative of where the rest of the church currently stands. They hadn't seen the visions that he had seen. He hasn't seen the Spirit fall on Cornelius the way Peter has seen it. And they have, let's just call them entrenched biases about non-Jews, about people who were different, people who are other. They'd have to process this new information. 
And so let's let's get into it. Acts 11, first three verses. Now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him, saying, you went to uncircumcised <laughs> men and ate with them. So word gets out about what happened with Cornelius. We don't know how long after this is. Is this a day or two after? Is this a week or two after? We don't know. But all we know is that something that happened and it just couldn't be hidden. And many of the Jewish believers in Jerusalem are really taken back by what they're hearing is happening. And verse 2 refers to a certain group of Christians as the circumcision party. I'm not quite sure that's a party it's a very weird kind of group there now but don't think of it they're not like a political party they're not like a denominational split no 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 all this is is there is a group of individuals who are believers okay please make no doubt about that they are absolutely believers they are saved but they believe the ceremonial laws should still apply to every single believer whoever they are whatever their background Okay, that's their stance. They believe that whoever you are, if you're saved, you have to come under this umbrella. God has shown us how he wants to be approached in the Old Testament, so it's not up for debate. That's their stance. Nothing's changed. We have to keep the kosher laws. We, we, have, to, we have to do the circumcision. Now, now, okay, maybe we don't have to do sacrifices because Christ is our sacrifice, but, but the other stuff still applies. Please, whatever you do, do not think of these men as cantankerous, scrooge-like old killjoys who are out to spoil people's fun. That's a very unfair caricature. I think these are just some men who wanted to make sure that the church stayed (coughs) true to what they saw as its mandate. They didn't want it straying. And you'll still hear Christians today talk like this. They'll say, well, a real Christian will read this version of the Bible. And not those other versions. Oh, no, no. A, a real Christian will know that women should dress this way when it comes to church. They'll not celebrate those holidays. Certainly not. Oh, no, 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 no. And they'll not do this and they'll not do this. And they have reasons why they think like this. They have, a, they have a biblical verses. They've got things that they believe justify why they stand. And maybe it started from a good place. But maybe it's out of line with what God is really trying to do. Notice, these men do not object to the fact that Gentiles could get saved. That's not their issue. They have no problem with Gentiles getting saved. They're excited about that. What they will have is issues about what that salvation will look like going forward. Okay? And that's, that's going to be Acts 15, and we're going to be building towards this. What does a Christian look like? What should the church look like? Whenever the reach of the church is becoming so broad, how narrow is the definitions of what a Christian should look like? That's, that's, all, that's going to be all the tension that we're going to be dealing with over the next week. These people will want the Gentile converts to come under their Jewish umbrella. You're not really saved until you do it like me. You're not really saved until your Christianity looks like how I think Christianity should look. And it's all building to that big debate. But look at verse three. The issue isn't with Gentile people getting saved. The charge against Peter is that he went into their house and ate with them. That is what offends them. You're supposed to be a good Jewish boy, Peter, yet you're associating with them. You end with them. We're so offended by this, and this is their contention. Remember, sharing a meal together with people in the Old Testament, in these ancient world, it was uh, symbolic of closeness. It was almost like a sacred thing uh, where it's an idea of family, of ending a feud, of being in harmony, of being at peace, of shalom with people. Peter went in and ate with these people, offended these this circumcision party. 
Peter, you're going around disregarding the Mosaic law. You can't do that. Listen, it's great that people are getting saved. That's wonderful. But you're going about it the wrong way. Your ministry is compromised. And you're compromising these new converts. Because if you disregard the law of Moses, they're going to disregard the law of Moses. This is offensive to us. You're doing it wrong. All I'm trying to do is to set it up this morning is to highlight how radical this is for everyone involved. For centuries, the Jews believed that they were God's chosen people. And by default, anyone who wasn't chosen is excluded. They are second class in God's eyes. But remember, the whole time Israel has been charged to be a light into the world, God's ambassadors. But instead, they had taken the slate and tried to protect it and shield it to the point where they would not let it shine out anymore. And while the gospel message is wonderful, good news to those who are unsaved, you can come to Christ, whoever you are. Praise God. This was a tough pill to swallow if you were a Jew. It's, a hard, to, it's hard for a Jewish believer to accept these others as equals when everything that came before the gospel told you they were second class. But God's message is clear. There are no second class Christians. There are no second class Christians. Now we talked about this last week. That there are those who have more intimacy with God. And sometimes we allow sin to disrupt that. And there's lots of different reasons as to why these things happen. But our standing in Christ is always the same. We are sinners saved by grace through faith, not by works that we have done. It's a gift of God, not works that anyone should boast in. It's all, we're all equal in Christ. Yet we still see it in churches. Denominations will lord it over one another. You'll have one side maybe saying, well, you know, our dress codes, <clears throat> our standards, our sense of holiness about the church doesn't compare to those modern churches. Oh, no, 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 no. Well, those in the modern churches that they'll bracket them in us will look and say, oh, don't you feel bad for those churches chained in legalism? Don't you find it so, so freeing being out of that and away from that? There's elitism on both sides. And people will point the figure and say, they are in error. They're doing it wrong. Listen, yes, I'm sure they're saved. Not saved like us. You're second class Christians until you change and you start to do it like us. And it's these kinds of attitudes that make us go back to Acts 10 and rejoice that Peter had the wisdom to take witnesses with him to Cornelius' house. Because verses 4 to 15 will tell us the story now for a third time. We've read it twice in chapter 10 and now here in chapter 11 about Peter's vision. Right, we're going to read through it again, but please, every word in the Bible is there for a reason. Every bit of it is information. There's a truth and a wonder to it. You will never be done mining the riches of God's word. But God doesn't do needless repetition either. So when God repeats something, he's underlining it for us. We ought to pay attention. But whenever an entire story is repeated three times in quick succession, this is God putting it in bold <coughs> font, underlining it and highlighting it for us as well, okay? He's making sure, guys, we better not miss the teaching behind this. And I love how Peter, by the way, just goes with the questions. He explains what's going on. He's going to tell them the story again. Peter could have easily have pulled right and said, hey, just remember who you're talking to here. I'm Peter. I'm the apostle here. It's my teachings from of Christ that you're following. All right? I don't have to tell you anything. I've been running this show from day one. I was there at Pentecost. I was there with the... I, I've been here. Don't you challenge me. How dare, who do you think you are talking to me like that? But that's not his attitude. I think he realizes that God has had to help him to reach these conclusions. And it's on him as a leader to then help others to that same conclusion. 
and to know for the church to truly thrive as one the people in Jerusalem need to buy in to this teaching so he can't just say shut up and listen he's going to explain to them why God is working in this way this unexpected way to them so let's go verse 4 Peter began and explained it to them in order I was in the city of Job of praying and in a trance I saw a vision something like a great sheet descending being let down from heaven by its four corners and it came to me looking at it closely I observed animals and beasts of prey and reptiles and birds of the air and I heard a voice say to me rise Peter kill and eat and I said by no means Lord for nothing common or unclean has ever entered my mouth but the voice answered a second time from heaven what God has made clean do not call common this happened three times and all was drawn up again into heaven and behold at that very moment three men arrived at the house in which we were and sent me to me from Caesarea and the spirit told me to go with them making no distinction these six brothers also accompanied me and we entered the man's house and he told us how he had seen the angel stand in his house and say, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and all your household. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them, just as on us at the beginning. So he details what's happened, covering the main points, but he's sure to get to the central point. Verse 9, what God has cleansed you must not call common. Yes, he thought it was about food laws initially, but he can have, you know, lobster and pork chops for dinner. But he realized it's not about food, it's about people. In fact, Acts 10, 28 makes it clear. Peter is in Cornelius' house and he says, guys, you just know, but as a Jew, I shouldn't be here. This is, it's weird for me being here. But God has shown me that I shouldn't call any person unclean or common. And so as if to underscore the point, to these people, the circumcision party in Jerusalem, verse 15, the Spirit fell on them as it did on us. God has blessed them the way he's blessed <clears throat> us. He's highlighting to them that God is at work in them in the same way as at Pentecost. You can't withhold blessing them if God has done, has blessed them. And that's fair enough. If God has forgiven someone, if God ha has, has, has shown them grace, isn't that sufficient for us? Who have also been forgiven, who have also been shown grace. But notice what Peter does to bring this home and to seal the case for the defense. One phrase, start at verse 16. And I remembered the word of the Lord. How I remembered the word of the Lord. How he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? When they heard these things, they fell silent and they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. Focus on that phrase at the start. I remember the word of the Lord. Rem understand that things are seriously changing in the church at this time. Things are moving at a fast pace. And the mindset of the early Christians was that they are willing to accept that God will forgive anyone. They are willing to accept that. But that person is going to have to come in under the <coughs> Jewish umbrella. They are allowed to be saved. Of course they are. Amazing. Praise God. But once they're saved, they have to start living a Jewish life. They have to be a Jewish Christian. So to turn around and say to someone, no they don't. No they don't. You can be a Christian without being a Jewish Christian. Well that's radical. It needs to be backed up. It needs to be anchored in something and so of course it has to be anchored in scripture. We need to be able to see a biblical argument for such an outlandish statement which is the right thing to do. Whenever we get to Acts 17, we're going to meet a fasting group of people called the Bereans. And it says that they received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. They, they, they studied the scripture. They, they didn't care that the apostle was there telling them this stuff. They, they went and they made sure it was anchored in the scriptures. 
The Bereans refused to take Paul's word for it. So even it was though it was him saying it, they wanted to make sure that everything that was being said was rooted and grounded in Scripture. Brilliant. Brilliant. Likewise, these believers in Jerusalem aren't content just to take some guy's word for it, even if that guy happens to be the Apostle Peter. And likewise, us, church. Likewise, us, please. Just because someone stands in front of you in the pulpit or uh, on, on some guy is on TV or on your YouTube channel or whatever it happens to be and says to you, you know, God told me last night, or you know, I was chatting to the Lord and he said, maybe he said, you know, I really think that God wants. No, no, it doesn't work like that. Let them show it in Scripture. Now, Peter was able to remember the word of the Lord, that it was grounded in what Jesus had said in Mark 1, verse 8. And that's important for us in 2024 going forward. Remember the word of the Lord. How much less trouble would we get into when we go into it and memorize the word of God and can call to mind what he says? So when somebody else says something, we say, well, no, because God has said this. He isn't going to contradict himself, regardless of who it is saying that he will. Do you remember how Christ defeated Satan when he was being tempted? He quoted scripture in the wilderness. In fact, it was Deuteronomy. How often have you used Deuteronomy to defeat Satan? <laughs> Christ did. And if our Lord and Saviour does it, how much more should we? We'd be far less vulnerable to dangerous doctrines of man and false teachers who are wolves in sheep's clothing, who would rather you put your faith in their word over God, who would rather put your faith in their experiences over God's word, or would have you put faith in your feelings over God's word. No, no. Remember the word of the Lord. For the Lord works according to his word, and his word is true. So we should know his word. We should study his word. We should memorize his word. So when somebody makes a statement about God's will, or makes a statement about what God wants, or what is God is like, we can measure it against the word, and that's our barometer going forward. So Peter is able to point to Christ's own words in Mark, but also to the Old Testament that would say that, you know, through Israel, all the, the world might know the Messiah. God's intention was always to reach the world through Israel. Going back to Genesis 12, you could go back and see that uh, through Abraham, promising that every nation, all the families of earth will be blessed through the blessings of Abraham. Or in Isaiah 49, you will do more than restore the people of Israel to me. I will make you a light to the Gentiles and you will bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. Zechariah 2.11, many nations will join themselves to the Lord on that day and they too will be my people and I will live among you and you will know that the Lord of hosts sent me to you. And there's more, and there's more, and there's more of these verses that show that God's plan was always to reach the Gentiles. And that meant that these men who raised these objections had a biblical response. And now they had the ball in their court. What do they do now that Peter has explained to them, look, this is what God said, this is what he did, this is what I saw, this is my testimony, this is the word of the Lord. What happens now? Verse 17. If then God gave them the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? Can we just pause and realize how much Peter has grown since before the cross? Since before he was filled with the Holy Spirit, right? Peter was the guy who was scolding Jesus. No, not so, Lord. No, I'm, it's not going to be this way. Get behind me. <coughs> oh. uh, no, not so, Lord. You're not going to wash my feet. You're not going to what? No, no, you're not going to serve me. That's not right. 
And he was always arguing with Jesus. He always wanted his will, his way imposed on Jesus. But now all he wants is to see what God is doing and he makes it his business to fall into line with what God is doing. Who am I to argue? Who am I to hear God's word? Who am I? Right? And in some his attitude has changed completely. <clears throat> what a change in mentality. And look, I see as we go into the new year, folks, there will be two different types of people in church. There will be those who will make their plans and then bring them before God and say, Lord, bless these plans. Bless these plans that we have made. But then there will be those who will say, Lord, bless me through your plans. That's a very different way of thinking. I want you to be in the group that lets God set the agenda. Too many Christians see God as an actor in their play, but they're directing. They'll do the script and they'll watch God work. And hey, listen, you know, some of you, you'll make God the star of the show and you'll give him all the best lines and you'll make sure that he's in the spotlight. He's getting the limelight and people will say, wow, look how prominent God is in your life, in your story. And you go, yeah. Yeah, he really is. But could I suggest instead of God being the actor in your play, that we become actors in God's play? Why not see what he would do with you when he directs, when he writes the script, when he leads and gives the direction and see what his masterpiece is that unfolds in us and through us. Peter is learning this. And everyone seems to realize maybe it's not the most important thing to think about how they fit in with us and how we do church. For if God has accepted them and God has made room for them, then we ought to make room for them too. Let's fall in line with what the director's doing. Let's fall in line with what the king is doing. Let's fall in line with what God is doing. He's writing the script here. It's not what we thought. But let's just get in line. Because what's the response? Verse 18. When they heard these things, they fell silent. And they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. Now, playing to the stereotypes is never a clever thing to do. But for those of you who have been to Israel, to the Middle East, whether it's Dubai or Egypt or wherever, you'll know that when the local men get agitated and worked up about a subject, they don't normally tend to be quiet and reflective, okay? They get noisy, they shout, they talk, and it's just normal conversation, but to us, the language and the gestures, it feels very aggressive and loud, and they're shouting over each other, and they're talking over each other. It's just culturally how they do things, and it just seems very aggressive and very animated. But these men... Not so. They fell silent. They reacted in their silence. And the wheels are turning in their heads. And what? They give glory to God. They responded in praise. They never would have expected God to work in the way that he was working. They never would have thought it possible for God to be so free and so liberal and so lavish. And they glorified. This is why I said to you at the start, please do not think of these men in the circumcision party as cantankerous, scrooge-like old men set on ruining everyone's fun. It's unfair. Yes, they were in the wrong, but they were not so hard-hearted or close-minded to close themselves off to what God might be doing. They allowed for the possibility to be wrong. They weren't close to the idea that God was working. They just needed to see it in Scripture. They just needed to see how it was anchored, what it was looking like, what it was supposed to be. They needed taught, but they were teachable. Praise God for people like that. They would not allow their preconceived notions or prejudices to hold them back. Their traditions, yes, they were there. 
but they came second to God's word. There was a willingness to hear Peter's response to mull it over and they accepted it and they changed their stance. They were glad to change their, their, their position and to be in line with God. They rejoiced in changing their stance to be in line with what God was doing. Now, when you come to churches in Northern Ireland, we did not have this reputation, right? We, there's more likely to see second AEC open up across the road, right? Or have uh, the reformed AEC or free AEC open up across the road. Or maybe just people would go off and join a church that already endorsed those biases that they have. But no, no. The, these men here were not only willing to accept that God had told Peter to go to Cornelius' house and eat with them. They accepted it with gladness. There, there wasn't a reluctance, say, with great teeth and said, Right, well, fine, if it has to be that way, then oh, suppose, right, come on to the church. No, don't sit there, sit at the back, right? You know, sit there. No. I, I think these guys are, are great. They're, okay, they're not perfect. They were wrong in, in their preconceived ideas. But their position was held because of reasonable things that they could assume, reasonable logic that their culture and their heritage would suggest to them. But they responded to the word of the Lord as it was taught to them. May we be so willing this year to change our preconceived ideas, to be in line with what God is doing, and to rejoice in his correction, to rejoice in his teaching when it challenges us on what we think is going on. Now look. What we'll find is that this passage is not the end of the discussion. There will be other people who will come along and will raise their concerns and raise the questions and raise their issues. And it's going to build and build and build until we get to Acts 15. Because they still need to figure out, well, how does it look like in real life? In practical terms, what does it all look like? It takes time for people to grasp how big the idea is. You don't just go with it. But as a, as a mindset, they were gladly and openly and willingly going to make room for what God was teaching. To grasp the fullness of this when other ideas were so entrenched. Now, right now, we're, we're, we're going to get into some of the most exciting verses in the Bible. That will be starting next week. But as we close, let's just finish verse 18. Because it says, they glorify God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. God has granted repentance that leads to life. They could tell God was at work because in the life of these new converts in Cornelius' house, the change was evident. And we can break it down lots of different ways, but we can start with this. The message that was taught was one of repentance. The message that was taught was one of repentance. These Gentiles repented and that was evident. Yet we know, okay, we know that they were good men. We know that Cornelius was involved, was a man who prayed, who sought God, who financially gave, who, who gave to the work in the local synagogues. And what did Cornelius have to repent of? Well, off the top of my head, and I'm sure not an exclusive thing, but what I know that he had to repent of was of the sin of not trusting in Christ as his saviour. Right? He had to repent of that first and foremost. That much I do know. Whatever else was going on in this life, he had to turn away from all these other things that he had put his trust in and put his trust in the saviour and his work on the cross. Regardless of how good he was, it wasn't enough to save him. Because only Christ can save him. Peter had made it clear to them and they weren't offended by that. They accepted it. They repented and trusted in Christ. And the Spirit fell on them. And they were blessed. But notice also there's a recognition on, these, on their part. That it is God who grants this life giving repentance. It's a strange phrase. I don't know how often you think about it. That God grants you the ability to repent. It's a powerful idea. Because it feels counterintuitive, right? 
says, nobody can tell me when I'm sorry. All right, I will say sorry when I am ready to say I'm sorry. You can't force it, you, otherwise it's not genuine. And maybe it's because some of you will have this thing in your head that, you know, like, I'm gonna get saved whenever I want, okay? You can't order me, you can't boss me, you can't push me, you can't, but here's the thing, you can't get saved unless the Spirit of God is at work in your heart, convicting you, drawing you to Him. We call it conviction, right? That feeling that sits maybe in your in your chest or in your stomach and your nuts, and you, you know in your heart that you have to get saved. You know that you have to do something because you know that you're a sinner and you have to do something. That's the Spirit of God granting you that opportunity to come with Him. This is God granting you, inviting you to repentance. Now, please, don't use that as an excuse to say, oh, well, if that, I, can, I, don't ha- I can switch off my brain then. I don't have to do anything. I, 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 whenever God wants me to get saved, then I will just get saved. It will be in his time. I don't have to think. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to worry about it. No, that, that's not how it works either. He's not going to make you get saved against your will. No good relationship is coerced. The invitation goes out by his spirit into your heart and you have a choice to respond. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have no problem in saying that both these things are true at the same time. You cannot get saved unless God's spirit is working in you and convicting you and calling you to repentance. While at the same time looking you straight in the eye and telling you, you must repent and call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. Repent and believe the gospel. I have no problem. Those of those things hold true. Just do it. Turn away from your sin. And I'm not asking you to be emotional. I'm not asking you to cry. I'm not asking you to never ever sin again or that you know you have to be perfect. No. All I'm doing is calling you to repent, to turn away from living for yourself and this world and look to Christ and what he has done on the cross and the life that he has in store for you. Because this is your repentance that leads to life. But this call to repent is not just for unsaved people. It's for Christians as well. Remember in Revelation, Jesus uh, writes the letters to the seven churches. When you go through it, you'll find that in five of the seven letters, he calls on the church to repent. So it's not just for people outside of faith. This call of repentance, this idea of repentance, it's for all of us. And, you know, I just can't take that as a license. They kind of assume that five of all seven Christians need to repent at some point or another, right? We're going to start the rule and just go around everyone. Hold on. All right. But, you know, maybe you're trying to coexist with sin in your life. Or maybe you're trying to slip into the director's chair and rewrite the script. Christian, don't forget to keep short accounts with God. Let me finish with this though. The idea of God granting repentance should make you have a sense of urgency. It should give us a sense of urgency. Listen, I've got this sense that maybe some of you deal with your sin. Maybe it's linked in with traditions or stubbornness or something that happened in your upbringing or whatever. But you know it's time to repent. You, you know in your heart, that, and God is convicting you right now, and your inner monologue is saying, yes, I know I need to be saved. I know I'm a sinner. I know I need to do something. But I'll do it later. I'll do it when I'm ready. It can't just be me the only person that that happens to on the regular, right? It can't just be me. We've all got that voice that says, yeah, but maybe we'll suck up to God a little bit first, or maybe we'll do this, we'll try and get things right, and then we'll try and sweeten the deal a little bit. But the fact that it is a gift granted, that it is an invitation extended, means we cannot play that game. Because we can't decide we will repent whenever we want because it's something that is granted to us. So if today is the day that you feel the call in your life to repent, to get right with God, or or to, to, to return to the Lord as a prodigal, then today is the day of salvation. Today is the time to do it. Call upon Him while He is near. Do not delay. Do it right now. Don't even wait for the end of the sermon. Do it now. Don't presume that the invitation will be extended tomorrow. 
Because if you keep rejecting the invitation, what is the logical conclusion? The logical conclusion is that when you keep rejecting the invitation, the invitation will eventually be withdrawn. Your answer will be accepted. Do you want to be saved? No. Do you want to be saved? No. Do you want to be saved? No. Okay. Today might be the last day God grants to you the invitation to come and be with him. Do not reject him. It's repentance that leads to life, not repentance that leads to death. It's not boring. It's not empty. It's not shallow. It is precious. I know sometimes as Christians we don't always show it that way. But it is a life like none other. And in it, there is peace that passes understanding. There is assurance of the future. There is hope and there is peace. There is joy. There is love. And all these things are found in Christ. So accept the invitation while it is near. And know this repentance that leads to life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that for anyone who has not yet repented Lord that today would be the day that they finally say yes I want that I want that peace I want that forgiveness I want that that ache in my heart that I know that I'm a sinner I want that God I want to tell if I want to know peace with God the peace of God in my life Lord for maybe some who are already saved have been trying to coexist with their sin. Lord, I pray that even today would be the day that they come back to you, that they let go of that sin, they repent of it, they turn away from it, they reject it. Lord, that we as Christians we would hate the sin that pulls us away from you who love us so much. <coughs> Father, the, this group of men in Acts 11 who challenged Peter. Lord, they were in the wrong, but Lord, we thank you for that they were teachable men. Men who were glad to be corrected. Men who were glad to make the change. Men who were glad to fall in line with your will. Lord, may we be such people as well. Lord, that we wouldn't allow ego or pride, or the thought of what other people might say if we changed our position. But Lord, that we would just be so glad to be in line with you, to be in fellowship with you, to be in step with you. Lord, that all those other things would grow strangely dim in the light of your glory and your grace. Lord, we pray that we would be a church set on you, fixed on you, teachable, Lord always growing, always abounding. Lord, that we might not only be more like you, but Lord, that we might know you and be closer to you. And so, Lord, we pray that your word would be alive in our hearts now, Lord, as we close our service, as we get ready to come around the table. Lord, we pray that the word would just be vibrant in us long after the service closes. And we pray this in your name. Amen.